Kai, everyone, and welcome to the Hasler Candidate Online Forum on Climate Action. I hope you are well. My name is Hugh Finn, and I will be the facilitator for tonight's forum. I'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners of land where the Hasler electorate is located, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and the indigenous elders, custodians, their descendant and kin of this land past and present. I also respectfully acknowledge the Baladong people, whose country lies along the eastern edge of the electorate. The Hasluck electorate runs from Double Yergin, Swan River, and Jogar, Canning River, in the west, up into the hills and through the beautiful Jeremary country. Tonight's forum is hosted by the Perth Hills Climate Change Interest Group, the Conservation Council of Western Australia, and the Australian Religious Response to Climate Change, or ARC. I wish to thank everyone who's contributed to organizing the forum and the candidates for making the time to join us and speak with us tonight. I note that the Honorable Ken Wyatt AM, the Liberal Pen candidate for Hasluck, and Stephen McCreener, the Liberal Democratic Party candidate, declined the invitation to speak at the forum tonight. Mayor John Smith, the candidate for the Australian Federation Party, was not available tonight. The theme for tonight is of respectful deliberation. Please join me in listening respectfully in good faith through the proceedings tonight. And I note that the uh, forum is recorded. There are three parts to tonight's forum. First, Helen Hines from the Perth Hills Climate Change Interest Group will speak about the group's position statement outlining the actions the group is calling for in the 2022 federal election, including recommended mitigation and adaptation measures specific to the Perth Hills. Links to the group's Facebook page and the position statement are located in the chat box. The second part of the workshop, uh, the forum tonight, will involve the four candidates having three minutes to outline their views and policies. The third and final part of the evening will be a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit questions for the Q&A session using the Q&A portal, which will appear at the bottom of your screen. Please also feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourself. The forum moderators will use the chat box to communicate information and links to you during the forum. Questions for the question and answer forum um, must be submitted through the Q&A portal. I will pass over now to Helen Hines from the Perth uh, Hills Climate Change Interest Group to provide an overview of the group and to unpack their position statement. A link to the position statement is located in the chat box. Thank you, Helen. Helen, you're on uh, mute. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the Perth Hills Climate Change Interest Group started up just a couple of years ago. We're a network of community people who live, uh, work and play across the Perth Hills. Um, to date, we've mainly had a focus on advocacy and support for local governments in the area of uh, climate change and declaration of climate emergencies um, youth. And uh, now the federal, ele federal election 2020. Now in our advocacy paper, and where we outline the main risks to the in the Perth Hills, and of course the biggest risk is the risk of catastrophic um, bushfire got a drying climate up here and significant heat risks and, and pollution and also risk of biodiversity loss. And we're in one of the great biodiversity hotspots in the world here. Um, so our advocacy position paper looks at how these risks uh, need to be either mitigated or adapted to. We've got a position on national advocacy. That's to do with uh, obviously looking at a science-based um, setting of targets and so on for emission reduction. But we've also got the main part of our adv advocacy position is looking at issues for, for mitigation or reduction of emissions and adaptation that are specific things that we need in the Perth Hills. In the area of um, mitigation, um, we're particularly looking at um, things that businesses, families and local governments uh, need in the Perth Hills in order to reduce the amount of emissions with a focus on things like uh, electric vehicles, charging stations, um, build en energy efficient efficiency upgrades for buildings and so on, um, and re replacement of uh, incandescent lights with LED lights. There are other things here that are listed in the paper and I'll leave it to everyone to have a look. But the other um, area of adaptation, one of the most significant things is um, 
the need to look at some kind of underwriting or protection of people's capacity to have insurance for their uh, homes and businesses in the, in the Perth Hills and also for local government infrastructure to be protected in the risk of catastrophic uh, uh, climate uh, bushfire conditions. Um, we, we, uh, we also have a position on the need to ensure that there's no further uh, density housing developments or, or a housing, a business precincts uh, considered for high bushfire risk areas, particularly areas where there is no risk, there is a huge risk that people will become entrapped. Uh, anyway, I don't want to go on too long because there are several others there and uh, I am, Emma is going to be putting up the link for people to have a look. Uh, at, at the paper, which is also available, which is available on our website. Thank you, Hugh. Well, thank you, Helen. And I apologize. I pronounced your, I mispronounced your name when I it's introduced okay. you. I substituted H for an L. Um, but, uh, but thank you, Helen. We'll turn now to the candidate presentations. So the order of the candidates um, has been determined by ballot. So hello, candidates. Um, thank you very much for joining us tonight. You each will have three minutes to outline your views and policies. I will let you know uh, when you have 30 seconds uh, left in your three minutes. We will keep strictly to time, so I ask for your cooperation in keeping uh, to the three minutes. As we're um, running okay on time, I'll read out a brief bio for each of the candidates as we go through. And as a reminder, please use the question and answer function to submit questions for the uh, question and answer session. So first up is Will Scott. Will Scott is the Hazlock candidate for the United Australia Party. Uh, Will was brought up in Lismore, New South Wales, and now lives in the Swan Valley with his wife and two children. Will has served as an instructor in the fire service and has worked on the front line as a career firefighter in the Midland, in Midland and Ellenbrook, allowing him to engage with Hasluck locals. He has coordinated several action groups opposing discrimination and fighting for individual rights. Thank you, Will. Thanks, Hugh, and uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, so for me, being here is an interesting thing. Uh, I'm from the United Australia Party, and being the two heads of our party, a minor and, um, and, and some outspoken views Craig Kelly has on climate change, I don't expect to actually win too many votes over, um, but we've got people, other candidates, that won't even engage with people. I think it's a very important thing that Hugh listen to the views of the electorate. Um, it's the most important aspect or quality that a candidate can have. So I'm coming in here because up until recently, I haven't been involved in politics and there hasn't been a need to educate myself thoroughly around the um, climate change topic. So I'm hoping to learn a lot um, as well as share my views and my opinions. Um, so, the party's primary concern going into this election is not around climate change um, and we're a new party uh, relatively so uh, for that reason we can't have policies on everything and we will say that our main policies are around the debt and while I'm not going to go in there into them tonight it is important to realize that if this country crashes financially we won't have the ability to fight for the environment or for climate change so it is definitely important that we remain financially viable and sustainable. Um, we are committed to solving the energy crisis within the United Australia Party, and we do have policies that involve carbon neutral um, power supplies. Uh, my personal views, um, I've actually been a greenie um, probably all my life. I was raised, uh, like you said, in Lismore or around Lismore. I actually grew up without any power in my house until I was about five years old. Um, we used to pass that. We were living right off grid. Our, our alternative power supply was one solar panel and two car batteries, and the power ran out at about eight o'clock every night. Um, I now have about six and a half kilowatts worth of solar on my roof, and I've always done whatever I can to reduce my personal impact on the environment. Um, I've got strong thoughts around things like deforestation, uh, sustainable forestry, small-scale agriculture and sustainable agriculture, um, alternate fuel supplies uh, for, for vehicles, um, pollution, um, the way that recycling is done. So the environment is not just about carbon emissions, and I'm glad that Helen spoke about this as well, because there's a whole lot more 
that goes on as well that I could delve into. Um, and also bushfire mitigation is obviously something close to my heart. And we know that there's a lot more to that, um, the actual reactive and proactive management of bushfires. Thanks, Hugh. Thank you, Will. Next up is Janine Williams. Janine Williams is an independent running for the seat of Haslam. Janine was born in Carnarvon and now lives in Lower Chittering. Janine has extensive experience in senior leadership positions at both startup and public companies and knows firsthand what it takes for both small and medium businesses to survive. Janine is vice chair of the Australian Computer Society's National Diversity and Inclusion Council and has won numerous awards for her work in promoting diversity and inclusion. Thank you, Janine. Thank you, Hugh. Um, yes, so uh, as everybody else heard, I'm uh, independent. Uh, my main reason for running is around four key areas. Those are the environment, accountability, diversity, inclusion and fairness, and openness and consulting, uh, consultation. From an environment perspective, we really have got a lot of work to do over the, the next few years. Uh, we should really have started probably about 20 years ago, but we've got to really change our focus from fossil fuels and we need to start ending the massive subsidies we have on fossil fuels and divert those to green technology and actually building a good, solid, sustainable green industry. Uh, we need to through that process, we need to prioritise sustainable jobs, not knee-jerk jobs, not uh, short-term subsidies. We need to really have a look at everything that the government's funding. One of my really core issues that I have is that all government-funded projects really have to have three criteria as a core. They need to be environment first, community first, and traditional owner first. If we apply those principles at the time we start a project, instead of at the end of the project, trying to tick off boxes, we're going to be able to get the best results for the environment and overall. And we should be able to, by doing it at that level, we should actually be able to get these things done at a minimal cost without having massive legal challenges, without doing rework, um, and without having to go through all of the, the issues that we currently have, particularly the ones that we're having here in Hasluck right now. We, some of the technologies that we really need to look at have to be true green technologies as well. They should not be fossil fuel technologies that are hidden behind a green screen. We need to use things such as carbon capture and those type of technologies as a last resort, not as a first resort. There's always going to be some level that we can't get rid of things completely. Um, and we have to be practical about that. But as long as we take a really good focus on the, uh, the green alternatives at the beginning and as our first priority, then we should actually be okay. That's, yeah, that's all I've got at the moment. Thanks, Hugh. Thank you, Janine. Next up is Brendan Stirk. Brendan Stirk is the Greens candidate for the seat of Hasler. Brendan is WA born and lives in Hasler. He works on contract as an emergency services safety advisor. Brendan also volunteers with St. John Ambulance, Auskick, and a local homeless organization in Midland. Brendan is joining us from his work site. Thank you, Brendan. Yeah, I'm actually at home now, but anyway, that's all right. Um, just thank you for inviting me along. Um, I came across a scary fact on Twitter. After the 21st of May, we'll have at most 28 months to make decisive changes and take rapid and concerted action to avoid catastrophic climate change. The next elected parliament will be in power for 36 months. Think about that for a moment while I talk to you a seemingly unrelated story. Farlap won the Aqua Clanty handicap in 1932. He came from behind. He won in record time in a different country after a bad start, many lengths behind the leaders with no training before the race and he split his hoof during the race. My point is that though all hope may seem lost, we have a chance of doing a far lap on climate change, but we have to at least be in the race and willing to run. The majors just don't seem to have the heart to start. It seems too hard for them to, to but, but to the Greens, it has always been front and centre the most important issue to address since its days as an environmental movement that formed an alliance with the Nuclear Disarmament Party 
30 years ago in 1992, which I was a member of. And during all that time, we've been mocked as a single issue party. While well, the rise of teal independence running on the single issue of climate change has shown that our time has come. And we are no longer the left the loony, left bleeding about the loss of a few endangered parrots or Tasmanian logging or whatever they want to label us. So predominantly, I'm running to get action on climate change. We all know it's an emergency issue and it's got to be front and centre. A perfect example is emissions targets for 2030. The Liberal Party have set their modest target at 23%. The Labor Party claim their target of 46% is sensible, which it isn't. Um, and it's not based on the recent study by independent scientists. So we've said we're falling with the scientists and we're setting out at 75%. Um, all it needs again is, is the will to do so quickly enough so that the fires, floods and other climate catastrophes won't become our new normal. There is no time for conservative targets. The planet is a ticking time bomb. The Greens are called radicals and right-wing press when it's in fact the parties not acting on climate change are the radicals. We are being progressive. So many people on social media are commenting that the ABC's vote compass is biased to the left. The problem is that both major parties have drifted to the right. The Greens are now the only ones standing who can truly claim to be centre of left and progressive. Locally, we have seen the devastation of the Waterloo fires and in the east, Lismore, the northern rivers and much of Queensland was underwater. The effects of climate change are now real and no longer, prob no longer a problem for our grandchildren. We must push for lowering on emissions, converting to green energy such as green hydrogen, solar and wind power. But we must have a just transition for those to be working the supply side of energy now. Leaving people high and dry is not the best way to do that. We actually do have to, have to plan for that. We've had a plan since 2013 and we've kept it up to date. There is a social media hashtag, the Greens taking credit for things. That's because we usually do it first, do it best, get ignored and then finally it gets taken up by somebody else and presented as their idea. We don't care as long as it's a good idea and it should be followed. We don't want the glory, we just want your vote so we can really start the process instead of pretending and blaming on market forces. Thank you, Ben. Next up is Tanya Lawrence. Tanya Lawrence is the Labour candidate for the seat of Hasluck. Tanya was born in York and lives locally in Mundaring with her husband. Tanya has held senior positions in both the private sector and government and now has her own small business. Tanya is particularly passionate about creating opportunities for local jobs growth and balancing this with protecting our environment and community. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you. So my apologies for not having my camera on the whole time. I'm literally on, a, on another conference concurrently to this one. So I'm just slipping between the two, but I was able to tune in a little bit. Uh, to the previous speaker, so thank you for that. Um, yes, yeah, so thanks, Hugh. And um, yeah, so for me, um, the you know where I live, I live right against Bilu National Park, so I'm very aware of how sensitive our environment is, um, even with the way in which we're managing prescribed burning. I think is needs to perhaps be reviewed in the context of how we might you know look at it perhaps a little bit more traditionally from an indigenous perspective but also scientifically thinking about um, the holistic impact of how we manage the environment around us um, i have experienced um, a home loss to fire i lost my home in 2j so from that perspective too i'm hyper aware of the fact that we are living the consequences of climate change and we live and breathe the risk if for those of us who are living particularly in the hills but to be quite honest hasluck has beautiful bush tracks throughout it and we saw that with the Wurulu fires of february uh, last year, where the vines, Ellenbrook, Brabham, were all on evacuation notice as well. So it's a very real concern and it comes up all the time for me on the doors. Um, and I'm also getting a, a lot of um, people very motivated and happy about the fact that Labor does have a carbon emissions reduction plan of 43% by 2030, which is obviously only eight years away. So we have to hit the ground running, but already I've managed to secure um, an investment at Midland TAFE as an example, where we will be doing the wind turbines here locally, actually training, creating opportunities for apprenticeships, traineeships and jobs. So this is a demonstration of where we talk about the Powering Australia plan and how it will create those 604,000 jobs is through this sort of example, tactical, tangible example that will 
lead us down to a renewable energy pathway. Um, and I think, you know, our community batteries plan, we've got like dedicated, literal, uh, tangible benefits that will demonstrate that we are going to walk the walk, not just talk the talk, to getting to net zero. Thank you, Tanya. Um, and thank you, um, thank you, Will, Janine, and Brendan as well. We'll turn now to the question and answer session. So the first question um, will be in the chat box shortly, and I'll read it aloud so everyone can hear it as well. Um, but Will, Janine, Tanya, and Brendan, um, you will each have one minute to respond to the question, and I'll keep time and uh, move us uh, strictly at one minute. And um, we'll use the uh, order of uh, Will, Janine, Tanya, and Brendan. Um, so I believe the, uh, the first question into the chat box now. Oh, there it is there. Um, question one, how will you address the rising cost of household insurance brought on by climate related risk? So Will, you're up first. Uh, yeah, so as I've said before, I'm gonna use a disclaimer that we're a um, relative new party and we don't have policy around everything, but I mean, addressing the cost of insurance is um, for climate related risk is one small thing. Uh, if we even address that one thing, how does that affect our household uh, expenditure? It doesn't necessarily ex affect the household expenditure on a whole on a massive level. So we're committed to reducing your household expenditure overall. So, you know, with our cap on interest rates and our stimulation of the economy, making university and take free uh, tax cuts. So while we might not have a focus specifically around the insurance, if we can cut your household expenditure in all these other areas, um, the insurance is going to be less of a big deal. Thank you, Will. Janine? Yes, well, one of the first things to reduce the cost of insurance is, of course, to actually help reduce the risk in the first place. So we need to make sure that we take good steps towards climate, uh, reducing climate effect, but we also need to make use of good mitigation strategies. So where there are funds available to help mitigate, uh, to help doing things such as training, fire plans, um, putting in place adequate fire breaks, et cetera. Those need to be done, that will help. And we also need to use some of the government funds to actually help underwrite some of the potential security, uh, potential insurance issues. Thanks, Janine. Um, Brenda? Yeah, I'm just wondering if the government can subsidise the, the cost of the insurance or legislate it that, that um, the insurers actually have to pay, you know, allow that people get insurance. That's that's the question I'd ask. And also the cost of living as well. Um, you know, if we, can, if we can make moves that the cost of living goes down, then people can afford to pay for it as well. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, Tanya? Hi. Uh, for sure, cost of living uh, is multifaceted and obviously Labor's got a multifaceted response to help in that respect from affordable childcare, trying to see a GP that bulk bills. Um, the community batteries, as I say, is, um, will be rolled out starting off in Stratton for us here in Haslump um, to connect in to, um, particularly for those um, homes where perhaps they rent or um, don't have uh, solar panels, it means they can benefit from more affordable energy. Um, but to the question of insurance, like my insurance went up $1,000, that is not CPI. Uh, so it is a massive problem. I am, I appreciate new homes um, with the bell rating re are required to build to a different standard. Um, and, you know, that comes at its own cost that obviously is factored into the build. Um, but for those who, like myself, um, live in these old 70s homes, mix of weatherboard oh, thank, and brick you, <laughs> and odd bits from salvage yards, um, then, uh, yeah, we face a different risk again. And consequently, yeah, my insurance went up a thousand bucks. 
Um, now, I know the government has already, um, it was done a long time ago, it has required that fire has to be an insurable risk. Um, but we saw as with the floods over east, they got the exact flip of us, so they've got the floods, um, that insurers are potentially looking for ways that, uh, that, that that's not a flood that counts for you or that was just water damage and, you know, and I've heard conversations with people saying smoke damage versus actual direct attack is there's different levels of insurance and you never quite know what your policy is going to really cover so I do agree there is a role for government uh, to ensure that these you know our properties remain insurable um, I've had previous experience in government government oh sorry with, Tanya uh, if you could um I know you probably have more to say but um oh, sorry I forgot it was a minute back. No, that, that's all right. Um, My bad, thank, sorry. Oh. No, that's all right, thank you. Um, just on that question, out of fairness, um, uh, Will, Janine, Brendan, did you wish to add anything in, in relation just briefly? Um, otherwise, we'll move on to the second question. All right, thank you. So the, the second question will um, appear- Sorry, in, Oh, yes, Will. Um, I think in fairness to all the candidates, we could rotate the um, order, so, you know, as we go through and, also, just while I've got it, I just want to apologise. The power actually went out here, so that's why my lighting has now died. Yes, no, I um, I understand. I think it's in the um, eastern area that there is a power out. So yes, no, that's a sensible solution. Will um, I, I think we might just then reverse the order if, if that works, uh, and we'll do that for each question. So, so the the second question. Um, I'll read it aloud, um, and it'll be in the uh, chat box uh, shortly. Question two. Research from the Lowy Institute found that 61% of Australians agreed with the statement global warming is a serious and pressing problem and the government should begin to take steps now, even if this involves significant costs. Why should those Australians vote for you and your party as opposed to one of the other candidates here today? So I think that question is in the uh, chat box now, um, but we'll reverse the order. Um, so Tanya, if uh, you're available, you have one minute to respond to that question. I think we might have lost Tanya. Um, Brendan, would you be able to speak for a minute to that to respond to that question? question yeah, two. basically, like I said before, we're following the scientists with our emissions targets. We've got the policies put together. We're talking about wind and solar energy, um, green energy. So we've got the blueprint there. It's all ready to go. The government just need to adopt it. Oh, thanks, Brendan. And Janine? Uh, yes, I, I agree with uh, uh, the people who think it's a major problem. I believe it is a major problem and we do need to do something about it and we need to uh, fast track what we do about it. Um, we need to make sure that we do it by a sensible method that actually creates jobs rather than destroy jobs. So I don't actually believe that it should be such a massive cost to the public. Um, and currently the, the fossil fuel system is actually being subsidised in the order of about $11.6 billion a year, which is way more than the green technology. So if we divert that money we should actually be able to do the green changeover at probably even a cheaper cost, to be honest. Thank you, Ginny. I will. Yeah, so in that statement, you mentioned that uh, the Australian people or the people surveyed think we should do this, even if it does come at uh, great cost to the um, country. So I'm going to go back to the fact that uh, the United Australia Party is the only party that's got a plan to pay back this debt and keep a sustainable economy so that we do have the option to pay for these things. Uh, because um, I'd have to disagree with uh, what Janine said there, because these uh, carbon, these green energy technologies have a significant higher cost. Uh, the production of them um, and, and the mining of them, um, to get them off the ground, obviously they produce free energy, but they production cost is, is massive. Um, I don't believe in subsidising any of the sectors, including the um, fossil fuel sector, but some of the cheapest um, carbon neutral energy you can get is uh, nuclear energy. Um, but we need to come in with a suite of uh, things. And if we start looking at all the different technologies, I think there's new and emerging technologies, um, especially around vehicle emissions. Um, and other things that we can do there in terms of alternate fuel supplies. So there's a lot that needs to be looked at, but 
again, going back to that statement that you don't, if it's going to come up at great cost, we're the ones with the plan to come up with the money so that we can look after the environment and so that we can keep this country running. Thanks, Will. Uh, Tanya? Right, sorry, and now you have my full attention. I just managed to um, finish off with the other group as well. So, um, but I did hear the question. Um, so why should you vote for us? So I'm hoping that um, those online and your families and friends have heard about Labor's commitment because it is something we are in that existential crisis, which is not a word I find easy to roll off the tongue, um, but it absolutely is. And Labor is taking it seriously. Um, and I appreciate, you know, people may have some concerns about some of the various activities that will continue on in Australia for, you know, the foreseeable future. Um, but the goal absolutely is locked in in terms of meeting our targets by 2030 and by 2050. And I'm hopeful um, that we will build the momentum and as technology obviously improves as well through innovation, we will actually well and truly exceed that. And we've seen it in practice in other countries around the world, particularly like Norway. Um, so I think we just got to get the momentum, we've got to get the action, we've got to take make a start um, and then we've got to just, you know, blow it out the water, we've just got to move with it. Thank you, Tanya. We'll now move on to, to question three. So question three, which will be in the chat box in a moment, the people most affected by climate impacts are those with the least capacity to adapt. Heat waves have been responsible for more human deaths in Australia than any other natural hazard, particularly amongst the elderly and other vulnerable groups. How will you support the most vulnerable to access and afford safe housing and essential services? And so, um, Tanya, we've uh, elected to reverse the order. Um, so if you um, could uh, respond first to this question. Thank you. Um, yeah, obviously, that's a very complex question because um, I think there is heat waves, but I think we're going to see increasing number of climate refugees on a, for a range of problems. Um, I think properties in Tasmania are going through the roof, aren't they? Like people are anticipating um, that, you know, that might be a better spot. But look, I think my main, my main concern is our Australian housing design is not designed for Australian conditions. I don't think it ever has been. Um, I continually am walking around new estates across Hasluck where there's not even a veranda, there's no eaves, um, completely reliant on air conditioning uh, for heating, cooling, no double glazing, no trees. Like it's, it's just concrete heat sinks. And I think we just literally have to look at the problem from planning up um, and we have to ensure that um, you know, from local government, state government, federal government are working collaboratively towards this outcome um, because, yeah, otherwise we're just going to be creating ghettos of where people can't afford to, to move out and can't afford to move around and can't afford to live in that house comfortably. Uh, so, yeah, it's a massive problem. And thank you, Tanya. Brendan? Yeah, look, I... Basically what Tanya said, um, build energy efficient houses and we've got a plan to build 118,000 houses in Western Australia, energy efficient houses. Um, I totally agree about trees. We've got to plan our estates and have trees in there too. And also we plan to raise New Start and the pension to $88 a day so people can actually afford to do things. So basically what Tanya said is pretty much spot on, I think there. We've just got to design, we've got to start adapting for this now. We can't wait. Um, and public housing needs to be sorted out big time. It's, we're not building energy efficient houses in this, this state at all. Our public housing list is huge that people are waiting for. So that's, that's what we, we plan, how we plan to address that. Thank you, Brendan. Um, oh, thanks, Jenny. I agree with uh, both Tanya and Brendan there. I mean, housing design is definitely a big problem, but a lot of the people who are going to be affected by this are not necessarily ones who can actually afford to get into those new houses at the moment. Uh, so we really do need to look at things such as reducing the actual cost of energy. Um, we need to start looking at people on lower incomes having a more livable wage and better being able to support um, themselves and to deal with the, with the situation. So it really has to be 
an across the board approach right from housing right through to uh, livable standards. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Will? Yeah, thank you. So there is some great answers there. Um, when we talk about, you said the most vulnerable being, being the elderly. So the United Australia Party has a policy that we're going to increase the age pension by $180 a fortnight and bring them up to standard. So we do believe that they are the most at risk. And when we talked about the most at risk as well. So there was a great freeze that happened in um, Texas in the last couple of years where people froze to death in their houses because the houses weren't set up uh, for what these Arctic winds. So having sustainable power supplies, and that was to do with the green energy as well, to be honest, the solar and the wind stopped working. So having reliable base load is really important. And having this also, having a good reliable base load, um, whether that includes nuclear, will bring down the cost of energy so that people can afford to make these difference. And when we talk about these sustainable housing designs, and myself, I'm actually from a building background, I've worked in the building industry since I was 15 years old as well. Uh, so I'm well aware of that sort of thing. Um, we can be doing that with our government housing. So if we're going to build it, let's build it properly, not just the cheapest crap that we can jam somebody in. Um, because as Janine said, the people that are struggling the most normally can't afford to get into these places. Um, but if it's government housing, they can, and we can uh, yeah, look at some of that sort of thing. Uh, thank you, Will. Um, we'll now move on to question four. How will you support households in the hills to build or retrofit homes to adapt to climate change? So I'll read that off again, but it'll be in the chat box uh, in a moment. How will you support households in the hills, that's the Perth Hills, to build or retrofit homes to adapt to climate change? Uh, and so we'll... Um, uh, Yeah, so look, a lot of this is around education and regulation. Again, being from the building industry, we've got these things on um, bushfire attack levels and um, we need to look at the way we're constructing stuff because in, in technical terms, you can build in a flame zone if you build your house to the right standard. Uh, so if they're educated right and we've got the right um, facilities in place, we can be building houses that are able to do that and also just the education of protecting your property because you see it and what determines whether or not a house is going to be burnt down in a bushfire has got a lot to do with preparation um, and in that case people have actually got to take responsibility for their own actions it's not all about the government has to save my house if we supply people with the education and the facilities to manage their own property and they don't people need to actually take some responsibility for themselves. Um, government subsidies for, um, for, you know, refitting your houses, well, look, I don't know that that's going to be a thing, but what is a thing is cutting the cost of living so that people can do what they choose to do with their money. And if they want to protect their houses, because if you choose to live in the Perth Hills, and I do, there was a house on my property that burnt down in the Parkerville fires, so I live in a high bushfire risk area. You take a risk when you live there. And you manage that risk yourself. People, that's 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 the way it is. So the government needs to do what they can, but people need to take responsibility for their own situation as well. Thanks, Will. Janine. Yeah. So one of the big things, if we're talking about uh, helping uh, people retrofit their houses, etc., is we need to actually have a look at some of the council regulations. We need to actually streamline processes so people can actually get changes through. I've been involved in a few council meetings recently and I've seen some of the red tape people need to get through. Uh, we need to help with education so that uh, we can actually go through and promote the actual benefits and the cost savings of a lot of the retro retrofitting. A lot of these things will actually save people money in the long term. I'm, I'm not a big... Um, believer in subsidies, but there are places where targeted subsidies for specific things are also useful from the government, particularly where they're, they're short term and have a very distinct benefit. Thanks, Janine. Brandon? Yeah, look, I think it's just an education, like what we were saying, and the local governments or governments at all levels just need to 
um, provide the training and education for people so they and give them a bit of a blueprint. That'll help, you know, give them all the information they need and um, subsidies are possible. I think that's a good idea. But again, and like Will said, sometimes people have got to take responsibility themselves. But if the government can give them the information, the training and provide them that sort of blueprint, they're, they're going to be a lot better off because um, people, some people just don't, don't know that sort of thing. So you, it's sort of a training and issue and education issue, I think. Thanks, Brendan. Tanya? Thanks. Um, so I think some of the candidates have already touched on a few things that I would too, and I noticed one of the comments about the building code, I hadn't realised it hadn't, hasn't been updated for quite a while, so that could be a tangible way government could step in. Um, we've seen it, uh, you know, for housing design for wheelchair access now is one of the new codes. So it clearly is it possible to make those sort of changes and, and have it rolled out quickly. Um, but I think, um, like I met with City of Swan uh, just a week or so ago and talked about this issue around working from planning from local government up. And I would love to see um, improvements there, like even the way we use grey water, how we, you know, manage those water catchment of all our properties, you know, be it in tanks. And I know, again, like Brenda mentioned about health regulations and so on, these are all very... Um, very conservative areas for good reason, but we've got new technologies now that perhaps we didn't have 30, 50 years ago on, and I mean, I'm on water tanks, I'm on solar power, and I have batteries that I click on at night to run the house. So I know it's doable, and um, I think, you know, the more we can encourage others, as, as Will and Anthony mentioned about education, the better. Um, and we've got good precedents over the years of government stepping in and offering subsidies and the like, be it for water tanks or insulation. And certainly, um, if we can find the right business case, I, I'd definitely be a voice to, to kind of accelerate the rollout um, by incentivising um, households to take it up. Thank you, Tanya. I will now move on to question five, uh, which will be in the chat box in just a moment. And um, I haven't, um, let me just wait just a minute. Um, but people can take a brief, a brief breather. It's been um, a very, um, a very compelling and um, wide-ranging discussion um, so far in the evening. So question five, it's in the chat box now. Will you push for no new fossil fuel projects, including gas, in Australia, given that the International Energy Agency has stated that there can be no new coal, gas, or oil if we are to achieve net zero by 2050? And so, um, uh, Tanya, that's uh, for you first. Thank you. Um, I don't think I would be personally in a position to, to respond to that without fully understanding exactly where things are at. I know with our targets, it's been very much around making sure that any new projects have to meet environmental, commercial, you know, that it has to stack up environmentally and commercially. Um, and also, I think the market itself is probably going to accelerate um, what is starting and what's actually closing in the context of um, like existing um, coal powered stations and so on. So I, I wouldn't be wanting to say I would be advocating for no new fossil fuel projects, um, because I think that would be too simplistic a response. Thanks, Tanya. Brendan? Yeah, look, the Greens have made it pretty clear that we, we, we don't want to have any more new coal or gas projects. We've made that pretty clear. Obviously, you've got to make that transition, but the transition's got to happen now. So we've got to get these green energies happening up now. So obviously, what happens in the real world is a different thing at times, and sometimes you've got to make that transition. But we've made it pretty clear that we don't want any more coal or gas projects starting. Thanks, Brendan. Ginny? Uh, yeah, I have to agree with Brendan on that. Um, I think we really need to cut all, all new coal and gas projects in particular um, and have a serious look at how we can start to wind down some of the existing ones. Uh, we do need to do it in a sensible um, and phased approach, of course, 
but yeah, we need to we need to cut it down and we need to cut it down fast. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, yeah, I'd probably line up more with Tanya on this one. That's a very simplistic question to a very complicated um, scenario. Um, I'd love to say no more fossil fuel projects, no more mines, no more burning of um, coal. Um, but the fact is that we've got a human race and we have an impact on the environment. And unless we're going to wipe the people off the planet, we need to accept that there is some sort of impact. We should be working as much as we can towards a sustainable future. Um, but we also have to accept some of the stuff that goes there. And what do you mean by no fossil fuel projects? Because this is going to be a very uncomfortable truth for some people. If we talk about coal, so we say, all right, tomorrow, no more, no more exporting of coal in this country. We're not going to do it anymore. Countries like China and India are going to keep burning coal for their, um, to power their, their countries. Now, if they don't get their coal from Australia, they'll get it from Indonesia. You have to burn up to four tonnes of Indonesian coal in a dirty way for one tonne of Australian coal. So what we need to do is not set these things of no more projects, no, now we need to be working with the technologies that we've got and the technologies that are emerging so that we can develop the whole world because Australia is not insulated and we can't operate on our own and expect the world to just catch up. We're quite a small country, but we can use our technologies to advance ourselves so that the whole world can be working towards a sustainable future. Um, and sometimes that comes with some uncomfortable things in the short term. Thanks, Will. Turn now to question six, which I'll read aloud and which will be in the chat box in just a moment. Question six, many candidates have mentioned respecting First Nations rights and knowledge when dealing with climate change. What real measures, genuine consultation or other mechanisms will you authentically engage in to make this a reality? And I'll just read it one more time. Many candidates have mentioned respecting First Nations rights and knowledge when dealing with climate change. What real measures, genuine consultation or other mechanisms will you authentically engage in to make this a reality? Uh, will? Oh, sorry, Will, are you on? Um... On, on mute. Sorry, uh, just having some technical issue, issues there. So yeah, quite a complex question and um, engaging with First Nations people. Um, I think that they're sort of very separate issues. You know, the acknowledgement of the First Nations people um, is not necessarily in my, in my mind, and I'm happy to be educated on this because being six months into politics, there's a lot that I've got to learn still. Um, are, are separate issues. Um, we need to make a sustainable environment, but we also need to acknowledge the First Nations people and we need to work on their issues. I mean, we're putting free university in TAFE there. So, you know, that's one way that we can bring up the quality of life for our First Nations people. We'll also be running a constitutional convention through the next three years um, where we can look at acknowledging them in the constitution, which is an important uh, step forward. So um, in terms of the other sort of environmental thing, the Aboriginals have managed um, sort of the bush for many years. Um, and we can learn a lot from them and the way they do that. Um, uh, yeah, the way that they manage the bush for the bushfire risk over centuries and um, have a look at that and learn a lot from them in that area. Thanks, Will. Ginny? And yes, so as I said in my introduction, I believe that on in particular government uh, funded projects, but really it should be on all major projects that infect the environment, we need to have a traditional owner first approach. So they need to be cons consulted, they need to be considered, um, and it needs to be done in a way that their views are actually taken into account. The Indigenous people have managed our land for thousands of years quite successfully, particularly when it comes to things such as bushfire risk. So their views need to be taken into account on that. Um, and really a lot of this land that we're, we're using for the exploration for the gas and gold coal um, 
is really of great interest to them. So we, we really need to take their input on everything and we need to actually do it seriously, not pretend and not bully them into doing what we want. <laughs> Thanks, Janine. Um, Brendan? Yeah, look, one of the Greens' big policies, reconciliation and treaty with Indigenous people. Um, it's so important and I totally agree with Janine. We've got to put them first. We've put them last for too long. And the good thing about the Greens is we're running many, many Indigenous candidates and Senator Dorinda Cox, first Indigenous woman um, from Western Australia put into Parliament. She's doing a great job. And, you know, they've got to have their say. We can't talk on by the heart, their behalf. We're white people. You've got to have them actually in these positions. You know, this is the most important thing. Involve them at every level of government and listen to what they have to say. And that's the only way we're ever going to have united Australia black and white is by having them having that voice. So at every level, it's, they've got to be listened to. Thanks, Brendan. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you know, the participants would all be quite aware that Labor intends to fully implement the Uluru Statement of the Heart, so voice, treaty and truth, and that would mean a genuine commitment to engage and to not just consult, but to actually listen and act on what we're hearing. Um, so I would hope, you know, if I'm successful, that I can be part of that process to see that come to fruition. But in terms of the actual question, um, I think the most tangible example that comes to my mind in the in the few seconds would absolutely be around bushfire management. And I think the patchwork sort of model would be preferable to look at rather than this broad scale um, incendiary dropping them everywhere across the bush um, for yeah, mass, mass areas. Um, and I think more selective burning to manage our larger trees, because I think what we end up with is just kindling, um, which just makes the next fire season even, even worse. Um, if anyone that lives in the hills will know parrot bush uh, just ends up with a, it's, it's just dry tinder now all over the ground after we've done a prescribed burn and not to talk, even begin on what's in the soil, what's left with the microbial activity because the fires are, you know, very hot. Um, not to say we don't need to do it, but I do think we could learn from the traditional owners as to how to do it better. Um, and I know there's a lot more we could be doing um, with ocean, you know, fisheries management, a range of things, particularly in the context, um, you know, that where we're exploiting so much of our natural resources and environment. And I think Lessons we should be taking here. Thank you, Tanya. I'm um, coming to the end of the, the forum for this evening. Question seven, uh, which will be in the chat box uh, briefly, but I'll read it aloud now. Question seven, more and more research is showing that the current approach of burning is actively increasing the risk of bushfire, not to mention the impact of tons of carbon being released into the atmosphere. What are your party's stances on hazard reduction burns, which are still pre in, which are still prevalent in the Perth Hills. So I'll just read it off one more time. It's in the chat box now. Question seven, more and more research is showing that the current approach of burning is actively increasing the risk of bushfire, not to mention the impact of tons of carbon being released into the atmosphere. What are your party's stances on hazard reduction burns, which is still, which are still prevalent in the Perth Hills? So um, can you? Well, that was a lovely segue of <laughs> what I just spoke about. Um, to be honest, I don't know what our federal government position is on that because I think at the moment it's all been managed at the state level. Um, so I'll be definitely keen to know. I appreciate that, you know, with the environmental minister, um, we'll have a much more influence over the management, particularly of our national parks. I hope so we can maybe influence the way in which it's done. And I appreciate they're under enormous pressure. And I don't, you know, I know there's a lot of good people on the ground trying to do their best to keep us safe. Like I know that's the whole agenda for prescribed burning, but I do 
I am deeply worried about our health um, because I'm sure the amount of smoke that we're inhaling for a good part of the year now is not actually helping us at all. And obviously we're just adding to the carbon emissions. Um, I'm also deeply worried about our flora and fauna. I'm seeing far less spiders. I haven't seen an echidna in three years. Um, all, I know all the kangaroos are taking refuge on my property um, because for you know for weeks and weeks and weeks afterwards, it, it was, it's, just, it's just nowhere. And because of the expanse that they're burning is so vast, not to mention bird life, nesting grounds, all this sort of thing. Um, we really need to look at it holistically, not just putting a match to something just to think about our safety, but we need to be thinking about the whole environment and the consequences and as I say we need to look at the soil as well because I think we're, we're drying and killing out that microbial activity that's going to support any rejuvenation so I, yeah I think we need to look at it uh, through a different lens. Thank you Tanya. Brendan? Yeah I'm not exactly sure what our federal policy is but um, one thing we do at the Greens is listen to the scientists and we also listen to Indigenous people so that, that's probably where we'd be looking at. And look at the science and you know you know make an informed decision on that but i'll try and follow that up and see where that sits in our policies but i can't remember seeing it as a federal policy thanks brendan uh Ginny? yeah well one of the things we need to do is we need to just stop automatically doing things the way we've already always done them um, we need to look at our, we need to look at the science involved. We need to, as, uh, as Tanya suggested, we need to, to actually do some more studies in it. We need to take input from the traditional owners. Um, and we really, we really need to just keep working and adjusting. So often government in general will fixate on doing things in one way and just keep on doing it until we all fall off the edge of the earth basically so really yeah i don't have the exact answer but we need to we need to adapt and adjust thanks Janine. Will? um yeah again our party doesn't have a specific policy on this either but just talking from some of the experiences i've had and, and what are, people i've spoken to and conservation experts up in the hills Sometimes we're burning too often in terms of, you know, burning every seven to eight years and it's not allowing our wildlife or sorry, our flora and fauna to regenerate. Um, and the leaf litter, if you actually pull it apart, quite often it's quite a wet layer underneath. So, you know, there is actually a, um, a role it plays in, in keeping things um, a little bit more fire retardant. Um, one of the other things is, you know, seeing bushfires go through and, and the way that they are is that, um, it really comes down to when you actually got the assets. So, you know, forget the thousands of acres of bush that are out in the middle of nowhere. Do we need to burn them? They're not near people's houses. You know, yes, we may probably get a more intense fire if it goes through, but at what cost? We need to be protecting the assets out there. And this is where we can also have a better firefighting attack. So our resources in terms of the fire brigade are severely lacking uh, in Perth and definitely something that needs to be implemented and I know Labor's got a policy around large air tankers and want to bring one online and I have to say I agree with that and would um, back that up as well but as well I mean there's something we can do without actually bringing more resources and that's that our bombers have the capability but not the right to fly at night we can be water bombing at night when we it's the most opportune time to take down a big bushfire so if we just change the regulations around that, then we can have far less damage being caused by this fire. And then we can look at the way that we're managing things differently. I've got to say as well, the same as everyone else, consult the Indigenous. They've been doing it for thousands of years. Thanks very much, Will. The, um, that brings us to the end of the evening. I thought maybe I'll just give each of you an opportunity to very briefly, as we're almost at, um, at eight o'clock, but if you very briefly just wish to have a, um, a few closing sentences to, to share with um, the audience tonight. Um, so we'll, we'll start with you, just a, a few sentences to um, closing thoughts for the evening from you. Look, I'm gonna just sum it up the way that I started really. Um, I'm agreeing at heart, always have been. I'm comfortable being um, with the United Australia Party um, because I think that they've got far reaching policies and we cannot afford to 
combat the environmental problems unless we have the money to do so. And we've got a plan to do that. And I'm just going to answer quickly a question that somebody said on nuclear. Fukushima was designed in the 1960s and built in the 1970s. Nuclear technology in Australia will be a hell of a lot safer. Um, there's a lot of reasons why, if you're interested, send me an email and I'll send you some information. Um, but yeah, look, I'm committed to fighting for the environment in many more ways, uh, reforestation and sustainable practices around farming, agriculture, um, and look, a plethora of things that I don't have time to go through in this short space. Excellent. Ginny? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things we need to keep be aware of through this whole um, process is that we need to be adaptive. We need to be willing to change. We need to be willing to consult. Um, and we need to make sure that we, we take the view of the entire community, our um, Indigenous um, owners, and really just make sure that we, we don't just make snap judgments on things and, and work with people. And, uh, and if we bring people along the journey, we're going to make a lot easier process of this. Thanks very much, Dean. Uh, Brandon? Basically, you, we've got the blueprint there. The Greens have got the blueprint to do this, this action on climate change. So have a look at our federal policies. Um, and I agree with Janine. This whole climate change thing is going to be dynamic. We've got to adapt as we go. And there's going to be lots of different things are going to happen along the way. And we've got to have a government that's willing and able to adapt as we go along. Thanks very much, Brendan. Uh, Tanya? I need to find a quicker way to unmute. Um, look, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. And I just implore everyone to think about the reality of another three years of a party that doesn't actually believe the climate science is completely disjointed on its, you know, within, and to think about electing a Labor government that is committed to delivering its 43% carbon emissions reduction target, its actual plan and steps to get there, creating jobs and opportunities. And I know when people start to see that, uh, it will create momentum, the, it, it will actually accelerate further change, and hopefully, you know, we'll be in a position to then well surely exceed those targets so yeah for me it's about we've got to create change we cannot carry on as we are we have to start um, and start transitioning out of um, fossil fuel uh, but it begins by getting a Labor government elected otherwise we'll still be talking about this for god knows how long we've really got to make it happen this time thanks very much Tanya and that brings us to the end of tonight's forum um, so you'll see in the chat box, there's some information and suggestions and links um, for possible further actions you may wish to take. The, I really wish to thank uh, Will, Janine, Tanya and Brendan for sharing their time tonight. Um, we greatly appreciate your engagement with the forum and with public deliberation about climate action and other related issues. I also wish to thank the Perth Hills Climate Change Interest Group, the Conservation Council of Western Australia, and the Australian Religious Response to Climate Change for hosting tonight's forum. I also wish to acknowledge the work that went into organizing the forum. Um, such for, uh, events um, as demonstrated by um, tonight are really vital for our democracy. So take care and have a great night. Thank you. <laughs>